in an office on one of the top floors of the capital city's main buildings, the representatives of each species from the so-called purification fleet sit very, very nervously. Their only solace in the current situation is that the humans have actually brought in personalized seats that are able to work with their individual anatomies. Though after seeing what humanity could bring to bear so quickly, they didn't want anything more than to go home. And they all looked at each other with the same look of, I really don't want to be here. As they came towards the building, they had seen that there were still bodies and parts still scattered on the ground, some of them still smoldering, others on fire, and some still dripping a little bit of fluid. The smell of death had filled the air, something none of them wanted to smell, as many of them were always up inside their main battleships the entire time. They were not ground forces, no, they would be out there protected. But now, now they see it. This sight that they saw walking in made even the forced representative feel ice go from the tip of his tail to the back of his skull. Though they did see something else which surprised them. Thousands of their own wounded being treated for their injuries. They could even see an entire group of human, what do they call them again? Medics, which have a strange nickname called Doc, working desperately to save a single Zechnekel that has its scales already turning gray, meaning that it was out of blood. Yet they didn't stop working on it, trying desperately to keep them alive. And to see what they could do was astounding. Human medical tech was something completely out of their realm of comprehension. They were using seemingly small devices that they could bring out, something as small as their own hands, and they would simply bring it over, seeing just a little bit of light coming out of it. They didn't know if the light was there to help or if it was there specifically to guide the stream of whatever they were doing. Yet they saw massive and deep wounds that were simply sealed in seconds. It was amazing to see this. It was unearthly, ungodly. Were the humans even biological? To those on the ground being treated, the humans that came to help them seemed to be the right hand of the Creator as they saved so many. The truly scary part was what happened to their fallen. On their way to the surface, they could see thousands of their own fallen taken into certain buildings and into several human ships that had landed, all of which had this strange marking on them. It's strange. It was a bright red, too. They didn't know what it meant, but they would find out very quickly. The Nashani commander was contacted by one of her own. When she received a signal, she pulled up her own version of a data pad and was absolutely astounded at what she saw. There was her brother. The, the one that she had heard was killed in combat. When she asked him about it, and how he was feeling. I, I thought you were dead. I was. The humans say I'm better now. It seemed almost lifeless, like he didn't understand what was going on, like he was still in shock at the whole thing. This also turned out to be a common phrase the human used to those they brought back, especially those that got spaced. The ones coming out of the pod would say, I, th I thought I was dead. I thought I died. The response was always the same. You were. You're better now. As the group of commanders discussed this, the humans entered. Four in clearly sharp-dressed military uniforms, shining a whole bunch of different medals and decorations, none of which they knew what they meant, but they realized that all these must mean something. Another four of armored bipeds walked in, but it was impossible to tell the organic from synthetic. Were they only one? Was it a mix? They didn't know. Along with that, Larry, Vince, and Cindy were also present, although it looked as though they were a bit out of breath, as though they ran into the conference room trying to make it in time. 
The admiral simply sat down in front of them with his secretary on one side and his treasurer on the other. Before we get started, can you confirm that your other invading forces in the neighboring sectors have ceased hostilities? Each of the species gave their own version of the affirmative very directly. Excellent. Now we can proceed. Here is a list of all losses calculated so far, along with estimates of how much is going to be owed in total damages. With a swipe of the treasurer's hand, they're able to see what this is going to be. They realize that this treasure is what the humans call a lawyer, someone who's not to be trifled with, ever. They realize that something was off as they began to read and look at them. They almost faint at this. The Zeknekel looks and says, This is a surprisingly small amount, considering... Considering what? Considering the massive amount of loss of life across all your planets. Oh, you misunderstand. This is for this planet alone. If you want a better idea of what has come out to, you better multiply those numbers by six. With this, they all begin to type furiously on their pads to try and figure out what the actual calculation is going to be. The Nishani representative. This cost will bankrupt our economy. Over half of our worlds will be completely destroyed financially. The fort representative decided to chime in. You cannot believe that we will simply agree to this. Even the loss of our entire fleet is not this much. Surely this must be a joke. This is not a joke, and don't call me Shirley. Most of the humans seem to find this amusing, as they seem to give off a strange little bit of laugh at this, some of them turning away and covering their mouths, as they find this very humorous. Everyone realized that this was the Admiral's way of trying to ease some of the tension in the room. He continues, We have the option of destroying your fleets, killing all of you and everyone else, sending our people into your territory, taking what we want and killing everyone that stands in your way. Now tell me, is that a better arrangement? The commanders are all silent as they ponder this, with all of their eyes widening in realization of what he just said. The Nishani once again piped up. Could we have some time to discuss this amongst ourselves? Certainly. And with that, he gets up and they all begin to leave. As they're walking out, even the ambassadors, the commanders, could hear what was being said. As Larry piped up, well... You take care of this. I've got another planet to check. The secretary chimed in. That is not necessary. We have already secured the sector. I'm sure you have, Larry said. But if I don't check in with the in-laws, my wife is going to kill me. Laughing, Vince chimes in. <laughs> That's what you get for marrying a forced. Really? The secretary asked. As it looks at the picture of her, she doesn't look like one. Without a word, Vince reached over and then moved his finger across the data pad, allowing the change of images to come through. It begins to cycle in through the pictures from not only now, but other photos as well. The first one they get to see is not only the first one where her ears are down, but now with her ears up. And now it's clear that she was an altered forced or an altered human, sometimes hard to tell. Then they started to pan through and realize that they had pictures of her before her transformation as well, which is commonplace when someone's about to be enhanced. You always get the before photos. The secretary wanted to say something, but Larry had already turned down the other hall as he headed towards his own shuttle. After taking the shuttle all the way to his ship, he got ready to leave, which didn't take long thanks to all the repairs being taken care of and, of course, the rearm and reload. But as he lined the ship up to leave, he could hear a few of his alarms going off. He immediately checked the readout and smiled an evil human smile 
as he knew what was going to happen before jumping into the void. Inside the conference room, the commanders continued to argue the, the point of physically assaulting each other. Thankfully, nothing more than a few thrown cups and one chucked chair. As they continued to argue, though, humans simply barge in and place a projector on the table. They don't know what's going on, but it definitely has their attention. A few moments later, an image is projected above them. A 3D image that showed another fleet of enemy ships coming in. The commanders immediately start to explain that they had the purification fleet. And once it faded, once it stopped transmitting, the extermination fleet would be deployed. If they didn't need to, they were just going to stay within their own borders. As it turned out, the approaching force had a plan B as well. The difference is the purification fleet was more for invading a planet and just either taking or killing off those that had been altered. It was not meant for major ship-to-ship -ship combat, even though they were able to do so. This new fleet, though, had nothing as far as invasion went. They had no deployment craft at all. Their job was to find any planet that was able to face off against them and end said planet, regardless of what would happen with the humans. They believed that if they put all their major battleships together, bringing all their biggest, baddest, meanest motherfuckers together, that even the humans wouldn't be able to stop them, and they'd be able to just simply slag an entire planet and drive on to the next one. Humans be damned. This was their orders. Which is why, when they were told to call off these ships, the commanders couldn't. They had no chance. They didn't even know what communication frequency the extermination fleet was on. They weren't able to respond. In fact, the extermination fleet was told specifically, turn the communications off. Unless it's some sort of emergency recovery beacon where they needed emergency support, then they were not going to communicate with anyone. They're just going to fight. Everyone could see this on the holographic display as weapons were being aimed and prepared to fire. Human ships didn't need to be told anything as they already began moving into position to protect themselves and the planet. The extermination fleet outnumbers them almost 30 to 1. Even though they had more advanced technology, the ships they were facing were just covered in guns and everyone knows you can still die if you try hard enough. And even at 30 to 1, many of the human commanders, to include the Admiral who was still on the surface, said 30 to 1? Sounds like an even fight to me. Which was mostly bravado. He knew that things would get ugly really, really fast. All of a sudden, they heard another group of signals coming in. Many on both sides just basically cursed under their breath, wondering what the hell was happening this time. But this time, it was the 7th Fleet had arrived in the system. Unfortunately, they couldn't get any closer thanks to all the magnetic interference. The gravimetric engines will only allow them to do so much so fast, or else you're going to start trying to break the fabric of reality, and let's just say that's a bad idea. Because they were well out of range, they tried to go full burn, and they were on the enemy fleet's 300 degrees level and just simply ran in. The main point which showed that they had no chance of stopping this battle is the fact that even seeing two separate human fleets, the extermination fleet didn't slow down, didn't change direction, it just continued. As they watched, they could see drones being launched from the human ships and space fighters already being deployed from the extermination fleet. The space battle begins, and for a moment, the skies burn as energy weapons begin to rip across the void. They're only several light seconds apart, but it's enough for some of the smaller ships to get the hell out of the way. The first volley is always the worst, as not only energy weapons, but ballistic weapons are fired from both sides. The human ships were not fully formed in formation just yet as the shots begin to fire. Most of the hulks were able to take glancing blows, thankfully, because of the way the ships are designed. 
the enemy fleet's main battleship took the main portion of their barrage. However, the heavy armor was able to tank all the energy weapons they could throw at it. Along with that, many of the torpedoes would cause the ship to shimmer and shake and throw everybody around inside, but it just wasn't enough to cause complete and total damage. The mass driver and rail guns, however, did something else. They fired so much, and they didn't have the capacity to pierce all the way through the heavy sets of armor, seemingly set up in layers specifically to catch said type of rounds, but now the front of that battleship looked like somebody's ex-girlfriend's voodoo doll. The other enemy ships, however, did not have the capability to tank all that fire and fell prey to hits just fine. Many of them, if they're struck by a torpedo, would simply ripple down all the corridors with the amount of pressure going through, have a catastrophic failure, and then just go drifting. The hard part was getting a hit. Even just a few light seconds away was minutes when it comes to the torpedoes. The distance allowed ships to dodge not only the mass driver slash railgun cannons, but it allowed time for their point defense cannons to take down many of the torpedoes. This was going to be an issue. However, the fleet continued to close. It didn't stop. It didn't slow down. It moved a little bit to try and dodge some of the shots, but they continued on their way, keeping their formation tight. The discipline that was shown was clear, and more enemy fleet ships were destroyed, but they just kept coming. The human ships that were struck, if they were knocked out of the fight, they were forced to the rear as they were not able to continue. They would have to take refuge behind the fleet in the second line, yet now they're getting close to secondary ranges, which means there's no dodging the main shots anymore. The seventh fleet is still moving at flank speed, but it can't do much except harassing fire, forcing the enemy to constantly change its trajectory trying desperately to make sure their shots miss, go wide, or glance off. Throughout recent history, human ships were known as invulnerable, indestructible, something you wouldn't want to screw with, but it seemed as though this fleet was specifically designed to take on humans, and they worried that the 14th fleet might totally get wrecked if they get within primary range, so that even point defense cannons can do something. Then everyone across all the fleets and even the planet heard something. They heard a warning of additional signals coming in, and they reached over every single commander would yell at their radar man and say, Friendlies? I don't know, was all they got. That is, until something came from the void. A lot of somethings. A whole ass ton of something. Looking across their sensor arrays, they could see a bunch of ships exiting the void. They're so close, they're within tertiary range of the enemy fleet, which is considered almost point-blank range at this point. They jumped in almost on the posterior of the enemy ships, lying themselves at 121 degrees plus 33 at 51 kilometers. They're almost on each other. As they pour fire into the enemy fleet, a communication comes in from the Vunchen Admiral. You didn't tell us you were having a party? With this, everyone realized this was Vunch and humor. Kind of funny, I guess, but not exactly what they were expecting. Under withering fire, the enemy fleet realized that they were not only now outgunned, but completely flanked. And as their formation crumbled, the enemy fleet did something they weren't expecting. They surrendered. Their main dreadnought battleship, now just covered in spikes that are semi-penetrated through the hull, and simply adrift. Their main weapon system completely destroyed. Many of the other battleships completely out of the fight as well. They realized that this was a losing gambit, and they didn't want to see their own people destroyed. The 7th Fleet, with the assistance of the Vunchen and many of the medical frigates from the 14th Fleet, secured the enemy attack group. As the remainder of the 14th fleet returns to guarding the planet, deploying all their recovery drones to make sure they can get all their ships back up, they made sure that they turned off the lock. 
as it turned out, the entire time that they were fighting, they never removed the weapons lock off the previous surrendered ships. This was just so those that were near the planet would be reminded the entire time to don't do anything stupid. Now that the lock was removed, they could finally unclench and take a breather. Inside the conference room, the commanders were silent. They couldn't believe what they had just seen. Everything, their last ace in the hole, was now gone. What the hell were they going to do? As the treasurer looked over and started reaching for the pad, suddenly the pad was reached for and pulled away and signed by as many as possible before the human had a chance to even touch it. They wanted to do this because each of them were wise. They realized that if they didn't sign it right now, they would be on the hook for all the ships that they had just damaged. They didn't want to have to pay for that too. And with this, a transmission was sent to all the other species' governments. The message was simple along with all the data files needed to secure this. The message was, the war is over. They all began to look to see what had happened. The humans were worried about their completely non-recoverable losses. Ships can be rebuilt and recovered, things of that nature. Non-recoverable losses are those that could not be returned after being shot up, dismembered, or in other way, shape, damaged. Across all the fleets, there was 16 which was not a huge number by anyone's standards. However, it was enough to make the fleet pause. These would be the first losses they had had in hundreds of years outside their own systems, of course. And those non-recoverable on all the planets was one. Thankfully, it was only one on Sigma 957. Unfortunately, when the orbital strike to keep the humans back happened, he was right in the line of fire. There wasn't even enough for a burial. He was completely evaporated. Larry received the news as he was heading down towards the planet to go deal with the in-laws to make sure everything was actually okay and they weren't just saying, everything's fine, over the comms. The planet itself looked like shit. Much of the foliage had been damaged by fire as the metal rain had fallen everywhere just like on his own planet. The difference was, on this planet, there is a lot of trees, and there is a lot more burnable material. You can set grass afire, but if it's not during the harvest season, it's not dry enough to keep going. On this planet, however, well, once you get the trees burning, like, oh, I don't know, maybe a reactor engine exploding, then, yeah, you're just going to have wildfires that go for tens of thousands of hectares and just don't stop until they burn themselves out. There are very large swaths that are just completely burned out black zones that can even be seen from space. Moving in, he landed right next to the in-laws compound. They both saw the ship come down and ran out to meet him. The grandmother immediately asked, Did you bring the kids? and the grandfather was glad that Larry did not. Of course, Larry wanted to know why, and the grandfather brought him towards the forest. As it turns out, the smell of war still permeated. He ended up having to actually fight hand to hand, but he had a few other surprises. He'd watched enough of the human movies that maybe, just maybe, he might have picked up a few things. Larry could see that the ambush defenses that his father-in-law had set up were definitely set up very similar to what he recommended, although obvious modifications were made. He figured this because Force really don't like using explosives. They prefer blades and bullets than anything else. Yet he saw parts up in the trees, parts that were still fresh as the local fauna had not gone in and actually started to chew it up yet. Larry asked him, how'd he do that? As they stood in one of the locations that was looked like it was set up for a final stand, his father-in-law looks at him and says, pull the handle. Where? In the fucking leaves. Where else? He walked over, 
grabbed a handle, looked at him, nodded, and his grandfather just nodded back. He pulled the handle, and an entire low-lying ridgeline exploded in sequence, one right after another. And with that, you could see not only debris from trees, but other body parts that landed close ended up flying all over the place. Since he was standing, the concussion caused Larry to fall flat on his back, and he rolled over, wondering what the hell just happened as many pieces of debris fell all over him. He looked over. And the old man was on his back, laughing hysterically at that. As Larry got up and started dusting himself off, he looked over at the old man, who was trying to explain in between breaths how he had used an old trick he saw in a very old human movie in a way to stop those from advancing on the compound. Yet, he looked over and saw Larry walking up. Larry looking over and realized that when he fell over, he had landed on a stump and might have bruised a rib. He was rubbing it, which made his father-in-law laugh even harder. That is, until he looked down at the old man and said, You're an asshole. You know that, right? Which made him laugh so hard that he couldn't respond. Larry, of course, turned and walked back to the compound, which he knew his mother-in-law was going to be pissed at the explosion. Speaking of which... Larry wouldn't say anything, but he thought he smelled ammonia in the air on the way out. Once inside, Grandmother yelled for blowing things up. However, he did stay for lunch, and they did explain to her that after any type of battle, if you have buried explosives, you need to get rid of them. You absolutely need to, or else somebody is going to hit them accidentally, and then bad things happen to good people. At that point, she just wanted to know, was that the last ones? Yes, dear, it was all he got. Larry looked to see if his father-in-law was going to give him a side glance or a side wink, but he didn't. So yeah, that was the last one, apparently saving just so he could make fun of his son-in-law, which he didn't really care for much anyway. After a meal and a little more conversation, Larry had to take off as he wanted to get home. As every warrior wants, he just wanted to go home. Reaching Sigma 957, he could see recovery ops continuing. He called out across the comms to see if they needed any help, but he was told that they got this, so he didn't even pause. He headed back to the holding area for his ship, allowed the cloak to take care of itself, and he headed back to the planet in his own shuttle. As he arrived in town, he could see that thanks to the AI and everybody's help, they were almost done with the repairs. It was crazy. He checked on the kids on the way because, well, it was on the way. He would have to make these a very, very short visit as he wanted to get back to see his kids, his youngest ones, and his wife as soon as possible. When he arrived at the house, he barely got the door open as the twins jumped up into his arms, knocking him back down on his ass. By the time he got to his feet, his wife came out almost in tears. This would be the first time she saw him since the battle ended, even though she had got communications from him to let him know that he was okay, she still wanted to see him in person. And there's nothing like holding on to your mate after the battle to make sure they're okay. Altogether, they headed inside as a family should. The victory celebration was a party for the ages across several different territories and several different species. The peace treaty had been signed and everybody just wanted to relax and say, okay, we don't have to kill anybody anymore. This is cool. Gregnar finally admits that humans are more than just ambush predators. You guys are just good. How do you know all this stuff? I know I've seen some of your history, but I figured you'd forget this stuff over time. Oh, no, it's not a good idea to forget. Trust me, you forget and you end up making the same mistakes over and over again. It's just the way it is. She understood this, but then again, at that point, she was already a few drinks in. And with that mead that Larry makes, it's not going to take her long to get plastered. As she was sitting there drunk, both he and her watched the kids play. Later on the night, the Admiral visits. And Larry was able to talk to him about how his great-great-grandfather was such a nice guy, such a cool guy too, and helped them make sure that they could reach 
to the stars and not have the same type of problems like they just had to deal with trying to purge all those that had altered themselves I mean hell that would have caused the entire human species to implode on itself horribly and they didn't want to see that shit twice the admiral though as he heard all the good things about his great-great-grandfather he started to tear up just a little bit Gretnar snuffed at this as she realized that this showed a little bit of weakness but then she realized what was going on and started tearing up herself a little bit and then not starting to make fun of him again Gretnar's like that when she gets drunk as she's in and out of consciousness but seemingly able to hear everything it's weird after talking about the old man he asked the admiral about the ship upgrades that he wanted so much the admiral asked if he might want to go back to the academy you know something that would be working again for the human government it was clear to even a blind man that this was going to be a quid pro quo thing yet larry paused for a second and looked over everybody having fun looking over all the families seeing his own twins just going and just laughing with their friends his older two kids holding on to their own children and then looking at his wife not for a while larry said the admiral knew someone's got to teach them why they shouldn't mess with a pursuit predator like us he said kind of grinning larry who was with the earshot walked over we're not known as great pursuit predators anymore gregnar seemed to suddenly become awake don't be concerned about too 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 much <clears throat> the, the word has gotten around about human stamina she said as she rubbed her husband's thigh though you, you have a different title now than than some sort of great pursuit predator but don't i i mean they still call you that but they 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 don't really bring that one up first the admiral was confused well what do they call us oh they they call you the universes or just the, the, the inner galaxy the, the ah with that larry started stroking her head a little bit and she came back to reality a little more oh that's right they they call you the ultimate ambush predators